You're on the other side now. <laughs> I love to do the maths, by the way. So, you know, it's... That's oh, the, thank you. Yeah, that's the ultimate test now for me to interview the do the math guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you're going to do a lot of these now since the new album is out, right? So... I mean, I guess so. It's... Uh, I'm just happy that anyone's interested. Thank you for your interest in what I'm yeah. doing and what I'm playing. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. You know, I've been listening to your music for such a long time. So it's uh, oh, it's good. a thanks for sending the new album. Also, I played it yesterday on my radio show. I have a radio show on Slovenian national radio here. And I think it was probably one of the first radios to play it all around. Oh, great. <laughs> Love it. It's so cool that uh, and the album, the new one, it's, it's just killing, man. It's like, you know. Beautiful, beautiful tunes you wrote on the plane. It's just amazing. And um, I mean, you probably expect it. I, I will jump first in with this one with every note is true and asking you. I mean, I know you played with Larry a lot, but like, how did this story with Jack begin? And what does it mean for you to play with Jack, actually? I mean, it's he's, you know. Well, Jack is certainly one of the greatest living drummers and uh, specifically uh, in the mid 80s sometime, I was a young teenager and I went to see Keith Jarrett with Gary Peacock and Jack DeJanet and oh, yeah. that was a concert in Minneapolis. And the next day I bought a drum set. I saw oh, Jack, wow. I was like, I have to, I have to buy a drum set. I have to try to figure out something about that because I was, I sort of went to see Keith, I guess, but then I ended up being most blown away by Jack. So he's on so many of my favorite albums and um, it came about simply because of the pandemic. I mean, of course the pandemic has been so hard on musicians, all the performing artists, but for me, it's also uh, opened a few doors as well as closed so many. So in this case, uh, Larry and Jack, they're both so busy usually, but they were sort of free to come meet me in a studio for a couple of days. I didn't know Jack at all, but Larry knows Jack and Jack likes Larry and Larry could sort of tell Jack, you know, fine, this will be okay. If you do this date with this kid, Ethan, you know, it'll be no big deal for you. He's a nice guy or whatever. So that's how it worked out. And how was the first meeting? Like the first notes you guys played together? Well, I always say that when I play with these kind of legendary masters, which I have done, if yeah. I played with a few of them now, it's always pretty easy. Hmm. They've, they've played with so many people, uh, they don't mind. You know, they're like, they just do what they do and it's great. And it's, they're used to adjusting. They have a lifetime of, of experience adjusting to who, whoever they're on a bandstand with or whoever they're making the record with. So. Uh, it for me it was uh, pretty easy, and I think Jack had a good time too. I mean, he was. I the the music is not hard to read. Super hard, yeah, yeah. I made a point to bring in music that Larry and Jack would feel like playing right away, because as you probably know, these days sometimes jazz composers can bring in a ten-page chart for every yeah, tune. All, all writing, yeah. You know, yeah. mixed meter, vamp, bass lines, a different form for the solo than the melody, you know, can go on for pages and pages. And that, I only believe in that if there's time to rehearse a lot. Yeah. If there's time to rehearse, then by all means, uh, bring in the composition. I mean, with the Bad Plus, we played the Rite of Spring, and that's 45 minutes of not improvising. Yeah. I just play a part for the duration of the piece. So I can, I believe in that too, if there's time to prepare, but that took us a year to get together. Yeah. If I'm meeting Jack and Larry in a studio, I want to bring in simple sketches, just the way, you know, uh, some of my favorite musicians work, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, 
There's not a lot of sheet music for Kind of Blue. Yeah, sure. There's not a lot of sheet music for Crescent. I don't think there was even that much sheet music for Wayne Shorter's Speak No Evil. I mean, probably everything, all, you know, every tune on that album, it's a very, you think of it as a composerly record, which it is, but at the same time, all of Wayne's tunes were just a page. Yeah, one page, page yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was my thinking uh, with Larry and Jack. Mm. Did, did you write this tune specifically for this record? Like thinking of Jack, actually, or you took some old stuff that, or you wrote, rewrote stuff or... Probably a mixture of both. Um, some things came up at the last minute as I got closer to the date, like, oh, I bet Jack would sound good on this kind of thing, you know? Yeah. At the same time, since leaving the Bad Plus, I've been writing a lot. So I actually have surprised myself with how much I've been okay. composing. Oh, well. And so some of the tunes were a bit older. If that, that, you know, I just tried to pick the best tunes. And we did record a lot more than ended up on the album because not everything was equally successful, of course. It never would be, yeah. especially when uh, the musicians don't know each other at all. So. I guess there's eight tunes on the record. We must have recorded it, uh, not another eight, but at least another six tunes. Really? Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, wow. That would be cool to hear the outtakes one day. Like, kind of. Uh, or, or not. Or, <laughs> you know, like for, in like 2062 or something, you know, when they re release an album, it'll be like, yeah, additional six tunes. Like. <laughs> No, that's good. But uh, how do you usually start writing the, the tunes? You know, like when I go back to Construction Zone, like uh, Corcus Bolero and stuff, I love those early tunes. Like, and you've been an extremely, I think, prolific composer for whatever, you know, the duo with Mark or Bad Plus stuff or your own stuff. Like, what, what, how, how do you work there in, in this zone where, when it comes to composing? I mean, thank you for your compliment. Um, yeah, Construction Zone, that was a, a point early on, I'm sure probably like most of us, you know, you're full of ideas. I was writing a lot, but then, you know, in the Bad Plus years, Reed and Dave were such great composers yeah, yeah. and they were prolific. So uh, I wrote the least of any of us in that band. Um, and I, I, I certainly learned a lot from both of them. I would say especially Reed, you know, I mean, Reed's yeah, he's uh, yeah. incredible composer and, and I sort of got to study him in real time for 17 years. Um, then, you know, more recently, I've actually been getting some commissions and uh, not all of that's visible or commercially available yet, but it's turned out that after a lifetime of thinking about music, the output is coming very, it's coming quite quickly. Mm, and yeah. I would say that uh, probably for composition, you just need to take a lot of input first. You know, so the, I'm, not a, I'm not against the music on Construction Zone. I mean, I'm, that's, that's happy, but it, you know, I also am aware that it's a bit naive, I would say. And ha having been listening to music, thinking about it, you know, trying to emulate my masters, you know, for whatever, the 30 years since then or whatever sure. it is, 25 yeah, yeah. years, you know, now I'm, I sort of know what I'm doing a, a lot more. <laughs> it's funny when you listen back to our first records, kind of like, really, why, why did that play like that? Or, you know, <laughs> like, although on the other yeah. hand, it's a, you know, a document of time where you were. I think that's also a nice thing, actually, to see the development. Well, you know, I don't listen to my early records much, when they, but when they come on or they come up and I hear them, I'm never embarrassed. I feel like, well, no, that, sure. I, I, the, I'm going to brag for a second. I always sounded like myself, you know, um, from, from those Fresh Sound records on. There was a, pers a point of view on all of it. You know, and that's what I always wanted. And I don't think I would have made the records if I couldn't present a point of view. So uh, certain things have gotten a lot better. I have much 
I can play the piano better. I have better time, you know, certainly more facility. I never was really, I'll never be the fastest piano player, but I've gotten a bit faster. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the in terms of an opinion that stood out, that I always had, and I still have it. So that's that part's good. You know. How was this formed with you? You, you, you know, you mentioned like, when you were a teenager in mid eighties, you saw Dijonette, but uh, this formation period of you, like, you know, your, your knowledge of jazz piano and jazz in general, when I, you know, when I study your interviews, actually, or, you know, read them, read through them, like you have an immense knowledge of music and how, how did all this, how did Ethan as a pianist come together then already on the first records, having your own voice, uh, and who were the first guys who got you excited, let's say, in, I guess, mid-80s or late-80s? Well, the older I get, the more I think there's no new ideas. There's just fresh ideas of combining old ideas. Hmm. And I remember when I got to New York, I thought, man, everybody is really playing like Herbie Hancock. And they're playing like Chick Corea and McCoy Tyner. Hmm. And a little bit like Keith Jarrett. There was a couple of alternatives. Um, Marcus Roberts had an alternative, and um, Jerry Allen mm -hmm. had an oh, alternative. Yeah. Sure. But um, you know that was even in the '80s. Like, but when, but when I landed in, in New York, that was my '80s record collection had some alternatives, some big alternatives with the young people, young in 1988 or whatever. Jerry Allen and Marcus Roberts. Mm -hmm. You know, Jerry was. She really embraced the avant-garde, but could play changes. Yeah. And uh, Marcus really embraced Jelly Roll Morton and the something of the, of the early jazz, right? But then when I got to New York and I wasn't listening to my record collection, I was just going around and listening to the way people were playing in the early 90s, I was sort of appalled. I was appalled at how everybody is playing that Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, McCoy Tyner, and a dash of Keith Jarrett. Ooh. A dash of Bill Evans and a dash of Keith Jarrett and then Herbie Chick and McCoy. And I just thought, okay, well, I can't play any of that stuff. And I remember I had a, a moment where I hid any records that those guys are on. I, <laughs> oh, wow. I, went, okay. I, I went through like two years. I was living on Union Square at that point, and I, I, my, in my CD collection, I sort of went through and I went through all the stuff I thought was the most over emulated music. So then after two years, I, I pulled out those records and I pulled out uh, Speak Like a Child and The Real McCoy and um, Now He Sings, Now He Saw. So I was like, wow, these are great records. I'm looking forward to hearing them again. But I did, I did sort of draw a line in the sand for myself. But that didn't mean whatever I was uh, playing came from nowhere. Of course, it came from whoever I liked, I would, you know, someone that I really liked was Mal Waldron. Really? Oh, wow. That's an underrated guy there. For and, you. and, you know, when wow. and that, that, that record, like the Bad Plus, we had a it was kind of a hit record. I don't know if it really was or not, but we, we played Smells Like Teen Spirit. Yeah, sure. The, yeah. Kurt, the Kurt Cobain Nirvana piece. And it, yeah. if you, it's sort of as if Mal Waldron is playing a Kurt Cobain song. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So like that, that that's, and then, okay, Paul Blay was a big influence. He was a big influence on Keith too. And most people yeah. get that side from Keith, but I, I have to say, I got it from the source. I was really into Paul Blay to the point that it, I really had to kill him off in my playing at some point. Um, if you listen to that album, you mentioned Construction Zone, but the yeah. Deconstruction yeah. Zone, Deconstruction. The, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, I, if, if I'm really kind of emulating Paul Blay, you know, and someone played that for Paul Blay in a blindfold test, and he said, wow, I really like this piano player. It's like, no shit you do. It's just because I'm playing all of your stuff. You know, <laughs> That's a cool one. so, but the thing is, if you're, in, if you've decided to be influenced by Mal Waldron and Paul Blay, that's going to make you sort of sound different than other people. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then I was really into classical music, still am. But I, I listened to all of Stravinsky, all of Ligeti. You know, I really got into the British composer Thomas Addis. You know, and yeah. 
then I would say, you know, like following, shall we say, the Marcus Roberts thread, I was uh, always interested in older piano players, too. Mm. And ragtime, stride, boogie woogie. I practice that stuff. I believe it. I try to teach it. Um, because I don't like the jazz piano tradition that begins with Bill Evans. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And it's quite commonly in, you know, not from the professionals. If you can really play, that's not how they think about it. But if you go into the academy, it seems to start with Bill Evans. Yeah, it so almost jazz, starts jazz with... guitar the same. Yeah. Wes is the first, but shit, you have like, you know. Right. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure for a, probably for any instrument, but specifically what I know is the piano. And it, there's this way of dealing with the piano that almost starts and stops at Bill Evans. And like that, as much as I fought not to play like McCoy Tyner or Herbie or then now Paul Blay or whatever, I really fought not to be just another person in the Bill Evans lineage because I think that, you know, they really got that covered. The yeah. humans, yeah. human race has got Bill Evans imitators covered. In fact, Paul Blay makes a joke that in Europe, the promoters can play like Bill Evans, like the guys who book, <laughs> book the good. gig. They're the, if they're a piano player, after the gig, they go to the piano and they do a nice Bill Evans interpretation. And, you know, I've been around the block. Paul Blay wasn't wrong. They're out there. Those promoters, they can sit down and, and play Turn Out the Stars after yeah. the gig. I'm serious. Sure. It's true. They can, they can play Turn Out the Stars. So it's, it's um, I mean, maybe that's another way to be distinctive is to sort of say, well, I'm not going to be in that camp. But back to whatever I was trying to say about the lineage, you know, I actually no, no, no. really, really love the lineage of um, Earl Father Hines, Teddy Wilson, Mary Lou Williams, Art Tatum, Hank Jones, uh, all, these people. I love uh, someone a little less known is Roland Hanna, Sir Roland Hanna. Mm -hmm, He's sure. a, yeah. He plays a sort of two-fisted piano style. And it's not uh, visible on record yet, but I've been playing more and more solo, and it draws on those influences. Really? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, it's, I wanted to ask you for your solo playing. When, when is yeah, that? it's not in the... I mean, a lot of my peers... Or I shouldn't say this, maybe, but some of my peers are... I'm aware that Keith Jarrett is the default for solo. Probably something... Actually, strangely, Cecil Taylor meets Keith Jarrett as a kind of yeah, default yeah, yeah. for yeah. modern jazz solo. And... When I finally present my modern jazz solo, if I ever do, um, it's really going to have a lot of Earl Father Hines and Roland Hanna in it. That's beautiful, Because yeah. I sort of like this, I believe in the sort of stomping, romping, stomping, two-fisted jazz piano. And that's the way I want to play it when I, when I get there. Yeah, that's so important that you went back. And what did that mean for you, like, in this early 90s, in New York, like, creating your own style, like, gig wise and like I, I mean i i know i've read you that i don't have that one the school work that you did like 93 already right and it's johannes weidmuller and right right you, dewey also is there on it like how did this connection happen and well that album is a real tribute to the keith jarrett american quartet hmm. that that was always my favorite keith music i mentioned the trio with jack and gear i love that too but at the end of the day i'm really about the American Quartet, yeah. to the point that I interviewed Keith twice, and I played a week with Charlie Hayden and Paul Motion, and I made a record with Dewey Redmond. So I can definitely raise my hand and say I, I did what I could to get close to the musicians that made that music. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that I revere Jer Jerry Allen so much is that she played with Charlie and Paul in a yeah. way that was not like Keith. She brought another bag to it. She brought the Thelonious Monk, Herbie Nichols, yeah. uh, Randy Weston, Eric Dolphy bag, Andrew Hill. And those records are really, especially the first two, I would say, Etudes and The Year of the Dragon, there's a real meeting of something that's very unique and special. Yeah. And Paul Motion, after we played a, a week together at the Vanguard with Charlie Hayden, Paul said we should record, but I actually didn't want to do it because I thought... Mm. Whatever I did was still some kind of Jared Paul Blay bullshit. Like it wasn't it wasn't that strong. You know, I, I had a great time. They played great. It wasn't an unsuccessful week, I would say. But I was so in awe of what Jerry Allen did with them. 
I kind of wanted her to have the last statement. Then, of course, Meldau got in there and made a record with them with Konitz. And it's, it's, he played a, his vibe with them. That, so he actually got the final statement with Charlie and Paul. Because that was a very special rhythm section for piano players, oh, I yeah. think. But just in general. But the key thing is so strong. Um, so, but, oh. Interesting, yeah. I mean, that's my sort of perspective on, on that. But schoolwork, you actually have schoolwork. That's the point. The point is what I, that is with Dewey trying to play the Ornette Coleman tradition with piano, which Keith is sort of the standard bearer of. And maybe we play Stella by Starlight on that, actually, which is sort of me trying to play Keith like Keith plays a standard. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, then in the 90s, I didn't work as a jazz musician. I was practicing. I sort of assumed I would never have that much of a career, but uh, I was... Interesting. Well, I, I, was, uh, I was playing for you know, just making music and the two-fisted stride piano style. I've always been able to play for singers. Then I was in a tango band with Pablo Aslan and oh. Raul Jarena playing tango, which is more like stride or something. And then I was in dance. I played for dance classes yeah, yeah. a lot, uh, hundreds and hundreds of dance classes, including for some famous names if you know the world, like Pearl Lang at Martha Graham, uh, she's a revered teacher. I played for Merce Cunningham once. Mm -hmm. But of course, what I where I ended up was with Mark Morris, who was one of the all time great choreographers. Yep. And he liked the way I, I played for class. And then I started going on the road with him playing the repertoire because I could always read music and I'd gotten so interested in classical music. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, you know, sometimes people write a bio of me and they, they say like classically trained or something. and it's not wrong, except, except that I I really, like, when I was a teenager, all I, all I cared about was jazz. I didn't have a piano teacher. I didn't, I didn't study any of that. I, I learned that all sort of more in my 20s, and then I learned it on the job in dance, which is really strange routing. I mean, this is nobody else, as far as I know, has done this routing. Because most, you talk to someone like Brad Meldau, he... He played Chopin at a high level, I think, probably at 12 or 13 years old. And then he yeah. sort of, he's had that ever since, but it, he's never gigged playing Chopin. I couldn't do that when I was 12 or 13, but that later on I gigged playing Chopin for Mark Morris. In fact, I played some of the hardest piano pieces <laughs> ever written for dance on stage, you know, in front of 3,000 people at a time, which is very sort of um, <laughs> unusual, I think. The, old, yeah. the older the older the older I get the more I realize what a strange progression that was but I was in the Mark Morris world content happy making a living for five years and you know I was about to turn 30 and I realized I, sh I gotta quit this I just I'll always regret it if I if I don't try to have a jazz career and it was, when, when it was, was that moment? That, what was the moment? That kind of I think decided? it was about it was about ninety nine, two thousand, somewhere in there. And uh, I had it in my notice, and then somehow the bad plus took off like within a year or two. It was like as if I wrote the script. <laughs> How did you guys hook up actually with Reed and Dave? Well, Reed, we had known each other forever um i'm from a small town in menominee and uh it's a tiny town ten thousand people or something and a slightly bigger town over was eau claire which was maybe forty thousand people but the um, university there had a somewhat renowned jazz program and for a year reed anderson went to eau claire i was still in high school and we met oh, okay and, and i think we pretty much bonded over thinking Charlie Hayden was the greatest bassist, which he is. And um, he said, you got to play sometime with my friend Dave King. And so we played together in, like in 1990, the three of us for a second. Oh, wow. Just, already. As, Jeez, wow. just, just like an afternoon. Then I moved to New York. Then Reed moved to New York. And Reed, more than Reed, or, Reed more than Dave or me, I think could have been accepted in the jazz world because Reed was working as a high level jazz bassist with you know with star musicians pretty quickly but he always had other fish fish to fry 
<laughs> Nicely put. But, but I would say that, you know, the three of us still, he's the guy that is the best natural jazz musician. There's Reed Anderson, for sure, in the band. There's no, there was no doubt about that. He could have he could have been one of the top call cats in New York. But he, I guess he was interested in songs and, and concept. And then uh, we played together. He's on my records, and I'm yeah. on his records from those early years. And then we played with Dave. And then I just remember at the first rehearsal, I thought, this is it. This, this is fresh. I never heard this before. As I said, I always wanted to be different. I always was looking for new, to make new music. And then at that first gig, I was like, oh, this is the answer. This is obviously the answer. It couldn't be more clear. And the audience response was also over the top. You know, yeah. People loved it from the first gig. You know, we'd play for people, and it was just obviously uh, the correct thing to do. And... Yeah, it was just a confluence of um, of luck and opportunity, I would say. And then within a couple of years, maybe I won't go through all the stages right now. That's funny. I should try to. Well, oh, I'm no, still. No, 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 man, now you're on the other side. Come on, I love listening to this. <laughs> it just well. I mean, well, the, what happened was. Um, I had started to play with Mark Turner and Kurt Rosenwinkel a bit. And that was literally the first time I played at the Vanguard was sitting in with Mark Turner. Oh, really? Oh, man. Which is, it's kind of strange. It's sort of an old school thing because it doesn't happen at the Vanguard that much. But I, And then Lorraine Gordon, the owner, she took an interest in me. I think we played a tune of mine and Mark let me have it like a solo intro. And... I guess it went well, and after she, she was like, who's that piano player? And then she like came to a gig to check me out. Oh, wow. And I brought her a dozen white roses the next day. Hey, Lorraine, thanks for coming again. She's like, oh, Ethan, you're so nice. You know, I can't give you a gig at the Vanguard. I'm like, I know, I'm just bringing you some roses. Then a week later, she calls and she's like, okay, you can have a gig. You can have one night at the Vanguard as part of the JVC Jazz Festival. 2002 and I said great amazing and then I, I remember I my first thought was um, I should have a quartet with Mark Turner Reed and, and Billy Hart mm, because yeah. I've been playing with and you know I just thought these are the best musicians I know and Billy played the Vanguard a lot Mark was already playing there and I, I called Reed and I said well I don't know man let's do this gig but I mean, I, the Bat Plus is so strong, but can we play the Vanguard? He's like, I don't know. So we both thought about it. And then we talk on the phone a couple days. He's like, man, Bat Plus. And I said, yeah, I guess you're right. Well, we'll play there once, and that'll be it. But at least we can say we played one time. It was sort of like the, the group with Mark Turner and Billy Hart. It already felt like the past. <laughs> and the Bat Plus felt like the future. And so we played there, and the first set was great, and um, the Lorraine loved us. And she gave us a week uh, that night. And she said, all right, next February, you guys can have a week. You guys are too good. Really? And oh, the, man. Wow. And um, Eve Beauvais came down, who was the A&R for uh, Sony Records. And I called him. I said, Eve because he had been interested in signing me as a solo. He actually wanted to make a solo album of folk arrangements. I've been doing that. He came to a gig and said, do you want to be on Columbia? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't. I thought because it, it wouldn't work. No one would buy the record. I knew you only get one chance at that. Yeah. This was before the internet. Yeah. I saw so many people make one record for Columbia Records and never yeah, do yeah, anything sure. else. Yeah. That was a different era. And I called Eve back and I said, this is what you, you, you want to sign me, sign this collective, the Bat Plus. This is, this has potential. I can tell it. The audiences are responding. And he came down and then he called me the next day and said, okay, let's do it. And then that, the, the gig that February, we opened February 11th, 2003 at the Vanguard with the Columbia record. These are the Vistas. Yeah. Oh, and that wow. was my 30th, that was my 30th birthday. 
Oh, ironically, again, you released. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, one, I somehow managed to do these things sort of around my birthday, I guess. You know, but but and but it was it was incredible, and the the place was full, and the album was launched, and we had. It, like nothing else was happening in jazz somehow that week because everybody wrote us up. It was just this weird, you know, luck. Luck is very important. Um, yeah. Someone I really love was this writer, Donald Westlake, who passed away a few years ago. And he told me once, um, or he wrote once, I read what he said, that to have a career in the arts, you need three things. You need to work hard. You need talent and you need luck. Yep. And you can go far on two of the three. I mean, really, if you work hard and have um, luck, you don't even need talent for a while. Yeah. But if you want to go the distance, you need all three. And uh, some of the some of the greats, you know, they've had talent and worked hard, but didn't have that luck. You know, exactly. but Bad Plus had luck. When our album came out February two thousand and three, everyone paid attention. We were a big t hot topic of debate. Everybody had to check us out. We got management, and we worked. We worked solid for se seventeen years. I was in that band, yeah. playing half the year on the road. Yeah, I, I saw you guys. I, when were you in Umbria? Like two thousand four, right? Or three? The first time. Early, yeah, early on. Sure, they tried. I us. saw and you that in that uh, hall. We, we drove from Slovenia to that gig for eight hours. We we drove. I mean, we saw Jared wow. also on the, the same. Right. And, and you guys, and it was just like I have goosebumps. It was such a killing gig because people were just everyone was just like, you know, Italian. Well, it was it was fresh because I think the influence of rock music hadn't yeah. been treated quite that way before. Most of the time, I. There's always going to be exceptions to whatever I say, but I think a lot of times when the piano players borrowed from rock music, they tried to make the chords more like jazz. Yeah. But we borrowed from rock music, and the chords were simple, like rock music. But then there was a sort of yeah, sometimes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there was this avant-garde influence: Jerry Allen, Paul Blay, Dewey Redmond. Sometimes I thought I'm I'm like Charlie Hayden in the left hand and Dewey Redmond on the top. Mm. But but none of that Bill Evans stuff. Yeah, I ha I didn't play a minor eleventh on a Bad Plus gig for seventeen years. <laughs> I didn't play a so what chord on the gig for seventeen years. Yeah, you know I didn't play a single Herbie Hancock substitution. Those other guys did. Uh, other piano players, peers, people I like, people I don't like. That's for them. For me, I'd rather kill myself rather than play a so what voicing on a Bad Plus gig. No. But that gave us that gave us a certain profile in terms of the sound, and it made it fresh. There were other things too. It wasn't just me. It was really no, no, sure. Yeah, it yeah. was, I mean, it's it was a lot of stuff. But if we're talking about um, what fe what we felt at that moment, that's one thing I remember. I remember these confused looks on my peers' phrase faces, like, "What are you doing? You're, I mean, how are you? How, you're playing triads, right? It's like fifths yeah. and triads." My teacher, Fred Hirsch, came to a gig at the Vanguard. He was pale afterwards. He was like, Ethan, you, you can't play so many triads. And I'm like, thank you, Fred. Yes, I am, by the way, going to keep playing the triads. Obviously, if you're so upset about it, I'm on to something powerful. Yeah, exactly. I mean, also rap, the repertoire, that was such a strong thing with you guys in the beginning. Like, how, how did you guys decide to go that route? Well, like... How did that happen naturally or just like well are you talking about the rock covers or the original music? yeah yeah i mean like the, the, the rock covers which you know made like this huge boom like in the right beginning. well uh, there was a several factors i mean one thing i should really say is reed and dave made a, a lot or if not most of the decisions about the rep of the cover repertoire because they knew the music i mean the joke is is that when i when they said, let's play Smells Like Teen Spirit, I didn't know it. And that's true. That's a true story. Really? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, well. I learned that for the date, for the record, for the gig. I was like, oh, listen to me. And then I like sort of transcribed it. I was like, okay, well, you know. <laughs> Flim, so cool, Apex man. Twin, that was, that was a hit, hit for, kind of a hit for us. I didn't know that. I just, I still don't know much of that music. A few things I suggested. I think I suggested Iron Man. Okay. And I suggested Heart of Glass. 
I mean, these just because of the most famous tunes, we didn't look for obscure material. That was never, you know, when I was in the band, that was never our style was to be obscure about our borrowings. And now, I mean, when I play with uh, Al Foster and Christian McBride, I played Now's the Time. I sort of like playing the most obvious material I always have. I, I, I mean, hey, if you're going to write something, that's fine. You want to, yeah, yeah. uh, that's a different topic, but I, I like being able to take the most familiar material and put an individual spin on it right away. Um, at my record release gig a couple nights ago in New York with Nasheet Waits and Larry Grenadier, we played all original music plus Round Midnight by Thelonious Monk. Oh, wow, man, beautiful. And it was, it was a, I actually think it went really well. It was a really nice thing for the audience and for the musicians, and it's also a very obvious piece. You know, that's the ethos I like, whether it's playing Iron Man or, you know, if, if that was clearly the point, though, at the beginning is if we're going to play a Nirvana song, we're not going to go for a deep truck, a yeah, deep yeah. track. We're, we're going to play what the hit. Exactly. ABBA, knowing knowing me, knowing you, that was a hit, you know. So that's how we chose that. And, and even the Rite of Spring, we could have never played another Stravinsky piece that wasn't as famous. But almost everyone has at least heard of the Rite of Spring. Sure. So that's why we should play it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you were one of the first guys actually started doing this, you know, this movement of arranging, right? In the early 2000s. Like, I mean, there were some people that, but I think you started quite a big movement that's still going on, like, you know, young people doing the rock covers or. But you were. Well, one it's... I guess so, but the, the other thing that taking familiar tunes and putting yeah, your own yeah, spin yeah. on it, it goes way back. But yeah. I think there's there's some truth to that that I will uh, address first by denying it because standards, jazz standards, there can be, they don't have to be in the hands of true individualists, but there can be a kind of a way that it's all the same harmonic language. Sometimes you say two five, sometimes you say bebop. Whatever the Bill Evans world, that fits that. And you can sort of, for 95% of the standards, that world fits. Sure. The minute the Beatles get there, pop music changes, and at some point it becomes considerably more, uh, it's less friendly to put on the Bill Evans thing. You know, it's two of my heroes are Keith Jarrett and Herbie Hancock. You know, but if, if you listen to Keith play All I Want with Charlie and Paul, he doesn't put any Bill Evans harmony in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's very pure. The same sort of thing when he plays Bob Dylan, uh, My Back Pages. It's actually the Birds arrangement he's doing. But that thing, he's playing with Charlie and Paul, it's sort of like Woodstock, hippie jazz. Yeah. And... Uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense. I, those aren't my favorite Keith Jarrett tracks, but um, they have a, a connection to Joni Mitchell or Bob Dylan or something that is, I don't know, I, I really feel it. The vibe, yeah, yeah. When Herbie Hancock plays on the New Standards, he made an album of the New Standards with yeah, Michael Brecker and people. It's beautiful, yeah. Or um, he made his album of Joni Mitchell. He puts in an, all that added note harmony. And for me, I, I respect it, but I, it doesn't catch me in the same way. Hmm. It's sort of like, okay, you're jazzifying the stuff that it's 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 not Rodgers and Hammerstein. It doesn't it's not as malleable somehow for me. That doesn't mean it, it's not good. Yeah, sure. It's Herbie, yeah. but, but so I think what the Bad Plus did that was a surprise and was maybe influential is we said, well, there, we can throw out the Bill Evans playbook. <laughs> Herbie himself is beholden to that playbook when he takes on that material. We weren't. Mm. And yeah. I have heard things since that's like, oh, yeah, they're just more like playing the song and playing some weird shit on top of it. And that is the Bad Plus playbook. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like when you mentioned the FX Twin, you basically keep the melody like it is. I, I played just like yeah. the original. That's but what I what's... mean. And th th that's what's the beauty of it. I think. Well, the beauty of it is Dave King's drumming. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, it's all three it's a fe- together. It's a drum feature. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's sort of features read, but I would yeah. say it's a drum feature. And what's really unique was Dave could appropriate that electronic sound in a human way. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that, that's why it worked. I mean, so so beautifully. Like, but I, I wanted to ask you <clears throat> just before that. Like, I, I mentioned construction and deconstruction zone before. Uh, how, how did those happen? Of you becoming a band leader? I mean, like, more seriously, you did schoolwork before, but how did that connection with Jordi, I guess, and Fresh Sound happen? And uh, well, you it was a most... band leader. How did you feel about that? Actually, like. Yeah, well, I wasn't much of a band leader. We played a gig or something in New York, but I mean, uh, that wasn't a really career, but it was all Jorge Rossi. Ah, oh, Jorge was it? Okay. He was essentially the New York scout for Fresh Sound Records. And Reed got there first with that album with Mark Turner and me, uh, Dirty Show Tunes. Yeah, and yeah. then Jordy liked, Pujol liked that and said, well, okay, why don't you do a trio record? And that was. That's how it that sort of went like that, but for sure Jorge Rossi was the the link. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, when I think about Meldo and Rosenwinkel and all those guys, of yeah, course. yeah, sure, interesting. But uh, you, you mentioned Jared. I have to ask you this: like, you know, you did a lot of records for ECM and Manfred, and uh, you know, it's a strong piano heritage on ECM records. And uh, how how was it like for you? working for ECM. I mean, you made like a really amazing step regarding labels. You're just going, you know, like Sony, Columbia, like ECM, <laughs> uh, you know, starting with Fresh Sound. Now you're like blue note. I mean, that's like, but like working with ECM uh, and Manfred, how was it like for you that? I mean, well, those records are yeah. beautiful. And Well, Manfred's definitely a genius. <laughs> I. I love Manfred Eicher. I love to talk with him. I love to hang out with him and hear what he has to say about music. He's controversial because he has such a big opinion. Mm, yeah. And in fact, I don't think any other label can say they've influenced the music quite as much as ECM. Yeah. Billy Hart told me that many times he's gone to a rehearsal and gets handed a chart that says ECM on it. In other words, they're telling a heavy New York drummer to play like John Christensen. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's so. Cool. So I mean, like that's pretty. That's pretty incredible. What do you yeah. think about it? You know, in in 1977 in New York City, in the heart of Afro American jazz, you had to check out Norwegians. <laughs> that's bizarre. Like right? that's that's incredible, and yeah. none of that is possible without Manfred Eicher. With I mean, do credit to. Christian Sin and everybody else. I mean, they're great musicians. My sure. God, I'm not trying to dog the musicians. No, but no, no, sure. Man- no, but Manfred had the had the vision. He had the whole thing. I mean, the albums had a look. They had a sound. They're also it's also great music, you know. But he was in the band, and oh, you know, sure. I would say uh, most of the time, I love it. I love those records, and some of some of the people I think made their best records for Manfred. A obvious example is Kenny Wheeler. Yeah, oh man, yeah, I love Kenny, yeah, all this stuff. But we love we love him, but the ECM Kenny Wheeler records are cut above than the, his other albums. Do respect, I'm not trying to dog anybody, but come on. That's no, no, for sure. me, that's to me totally obvious. Sam Rivers, his album Contrasts, I really love it. I, th- it's, I think it's better recorded and more charismatic than most of Sam's other albums. Mm-hmm. Art Ensemble of Chicago, I, I don't know all the records so well, but the ECM Art Ensemble records are awesome. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, then, then then there's there's people like John Abercrombie and Keith Jarrett who, you know, their whole catalog is on ECM and Dove's Tales with Manfred's thing. It, it's there's no, there's no way to separate it. Yeah, that's the sound. Too. You know, there's there's, a, there's sometimes the problems. I, uh, mm-hmm. old and new dreams is one of my favorite bands, and they made a record for Black Saint, mm-hmm. and they made and then they make it a studio record for ECM. They're both called Old and New Dreams. It's a little confusing, 
And frankly, I think the Black Saint one is much better. Um, there, it has the. It's even like the way it's recorded better. It mm -hmm. suits that aesthetic. The, now, the ECM yeah, record. Yeah. The ECM record is good too, of course. But it, you can tell Manfred is sort of in there making it something. It's, it's not as easy a fit. Um, for that matter, Paul Motion Trio with Lovano and Frizzell, I mean, anything they do has quality, but some of the soul note Paul Motion stuff is raw mm -hmm. and more yeah, chaotic. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's it's got a kind of energy that I really respond to that the later ECMs, it can feel a little sleepy. Mm. You know. But uh, anyone who's that powerful like Manfred Eicher, it's gonna it's gonna be like that. You know, there's going to be its ups and downs. But sure. uh, I'd, I'd love Maverick. I'd love working with him. I hope I can work with him again at some point. Um, and his uh, comments while recording, I would say especially the duo record with Mark Turner. Yeah. You know, that's were a, illuminating. It's incredible. How, how did that one work? Just you two and Manfred, Manfred like... Well, Mark and I knew we were making an ECM album. Like, that's one thing I think it's important to know, too. He's a member of the band. So you go in there proposing a repertoire that is going to fit the aesthetic. Yeah. So um, Man uh, Mark Turner and I both love ECM records. We both love Matt, but there was no problem. We were on the same page. And, uh, yeah, I'm very happy with that album, especially the first tune, I mean... Yesterday's okay. No, uh, no. Uh, and Lugano, I know. I, I know. Lugano, yeah. yeah, yeah Lugano. I mean, I, I, I don't think we could have played it any better, I and mean, we never played yeah. it better live or anything like that. That's, that's the statement. And some of that is Manfred's there listening to you. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's 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 Manfred at ECM. He's he's brilliant. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I love this face. Those those records that you did with Tom Harrell and. The duo with, and of course with Billy Hart. I mean, like, nice to hear you play piano on ECM. I mean, it's it's a different vibe, you know. Than, let's say this one on Blue Note. It's a different sound, also. Oh, for sure. You know, yeah, absolutely. Nice to hear you that. But uh, you mentioned Billy a couple of times, and y you know, talking about Dijonette in the beginning. Jack is like 80, I think, and Billy Hart is 82, or I think this year is going to be 82. And uh, how did you hook up with Billy, actually, and start playing? I, I mean, you did Minor Passions, right, with Billy. But, like, how did the story with him begin? Like, how did he discover you or you him? Or <laughs> Well, um, I was on a record date with Christoph Schweitzer, the trombonist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Billy was on it, too. And I just remember at the first rehearsal, feeling, listening to Billy's like, this is what I need in my life. Totally clear message. And so then I just started pursuing Billy Hart. I got him from my record. And uh, after the Bad Plus had our surprise breakout, I, I wanted to keep my connection to the New York Cats, shall we say, because I could feel it was going to be a, a problem. Which it honestly was, was, you know, when you have a big success, the community yeah. reacts in positive and many times negative ways. So I thought, man, I want to, I want to play with the people I think are, you know, the, the hippest jazz cats. And my favorite band was Kurt Rosenwinkel's group with Jeff Ballard, Mark Turner and Ben Street. So I, yeah. I took, I took Mark and Ben from that. And Billy Hart, who was the greatest drummer I'd gotten to play with. And we played a week. And But, you know, Billy, at the end of the week, said, I've got a gig in two weeks in Montclair. This was really fun. Can you guys come play my music? Mm, okay. And so we did that, and immediately it was much better. Billy announced tunes on the record, and he was the best musician in the band, and we played his tunes, and it was like, okay, it all sort of settled. And we took an in, in, internal vote and we gave the band to Billy if he wanted the band. And he said yes. And so since then, you know, it's, that's been a long time now that that band's been together. And we just made a new record for ECM, actually. Um, really? Oh, in wow. December. It should be out. I mean, 
I hope it's out soon. Oh, beautiful, man. Wow. That's looking but, forward uh, to it. Yeah, that's, it's actually really strong. It was really a pleasurable session. We knew the music really well, and we've been out there a lot. So, because the last one now is quite old. Yeah, yeah. it's like two. All, yeah. All Our Reasons is over a decade old at this point. Yeah. So it's really time for an update. And we are playing the Vanguard in October, and we have plans to record it. Because there's there's been, it, we've all really developed in that band. And it really has a strong uh, language at this point. Like, we really know what we're doing. And uh, I would say that Ben and Mark, if, they, if you were talking to them right now, they would both say they've learned so much from Billy Hart. And for myself, it, I can't say it too strongly. Like, he's he's really my lodestar. And you mentioned that I you know, I write about jazz and I, all these articles. I mean, a, a lot of times I'm writing what Billy Hart told me. <laughs> mm. I've earned his trust. He's told me some secrets and then I've disabused his trust by then putting these secrets out into the world. I'm serious. It sort of works like that a little bit, you know. But, uh, yeah, Billy is one of the greatest drummers and, and I would say yeah. in a way underrated Although yeah. this a year ago he got the NEA Jazz Masters Award and he's still young enough and playing great, you know. So he's you know we're playing this year and it's it's good for him to have the recognition. And um, but apart from his Amazing. supreme drumming, everybody loves him and he's always been so generous with all the young musicians. He'll play with anybody and he'll tell you the secrets of the music to your face. He'll demonstrate it by playing and then he'll tell you too. And it's he's really helped so many of us. So. God bless yeah. Billy Hart, for sure. That's beautiful. Yeah, man. Yeah, so nice to hear that. I mean, I, I, I saw some footage you guys did in Piacenza uh, in October, I guess, before the recording. And it's okay. burning how you guys play. It's really like... Oh, really? Okay, great. Yeah, it's like a next step. I mean, of course, life, it's a different vibe than the studio recording. Yeah, yeah. Th that's why I want... I, live, it can get pretty special. So that's why we're planning to do it at the Vanguard, you know, God willing, in October. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, Ethan, not to take m more of your time, just uh, what are the plans to promote the new album, the trio? Like, I guess not with Jack, but like, uh, what are your thinkings of to promote it in Europe and tours or? Well, I mean, I don't have uh, any concrete plans. Also, because of the pandemic, it's been hard to sort of. Sure. Um, to be honest, uh, if I get to play with Billy Hart, that's sort of good it, it you know uh, if if someone woke me up in the middle of the night and said we have a week in Italy next week your trio or the Billy Hart quartet I would say the Billy Hart quartet mm, well yeah but uh, in the future is coming more and more uh, composition projects I for the record release here in Boston and New York there's a 40, 45 minute suite through composed called oh, really? Ritornello, Sinfonias and Cadenzas. And it went really well, especially in Brooklyn, it went great. And the audience reaction, it was sort of reminded me of early Bad Plus days, actually, you know, like, okay, this is, and so we'll see, uh, it's harder to pull this stuff off, but I do want to write for big band a lot more. Oh yeah, you did the power record. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that stuff, man. That that was a, such a surprise that when I found yeah. that, out of that one, I was like, man, that's a killing one. <laughs> like, yeah, beautiful. and yeah. I I'm I wrote eight sonatas during the pandemic for solo instruments and piano. I, that'll probably get recorded later this year too. Oh, fantastic! So I mean, the there's a lot of smoking trio piano players out there and probably they don't need that much more ethan iverson really i'll do i'm gonna do it <laughs> you're not gonna get rid of me but i don't also feel like i have seven teams with the bad plus i played every venue in the world it was oh, great sorry. i'm not gonna try to climb that mountain again as a trio pianist now i'm turning 50 next year i've been lucky to do the things I, i've done um but i i am planning to be visible as a curator, as an organizer, as a composer, and, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. It's sort of like 
big ambition, but at the same time, I just put out a record with Jack Dijonette on Blue Notes. So, I mean, I, yeah. I seem to have some luck with these things, so who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful. Like, like I said, uh, w when I check my record collection of you and the labels, how you are now, like, it's quite amazing. Uh, so, you know, congrats that to what you're doing. You must be doing something right. So the, <laughs> I guess you, so. You're playing the right notes, so, you know. <laughs> Well, some of it really is that harmonic perspective. I was talking about the the bad plus, but you know, Jack at the studio said, um, "Man, Ethan, you play a lot of triads." I was like, "Yeah," I mean, he the way he said it, it was sort of like he didn't. I don't know if he liked it. <laughs> I mean, he he was he was like, "It was really different." I'm like, "Yeah, it is different." But but Jack, you know, I learned that partly from you. Uh, from your tune Blue on yeah. Gate Gateway 2 with Abercrombie and Holland. He plays piano on that. It's a great piece. And the cadence is a triad, the final cadence. And so then he taught it to me, and we did a take. And, of course, it ends on a triad. So that was satisfying. That yeah. was very satisfying. Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean... I hope to catch you if you're going to be in Europe in Europe this year somewhere. Uh, I, it's a, I'm supposed to be there in the summer and fall with Billy Hart, COVID permitting. And sure. I, I, have a, I have a feeling I'll be there with a trio and different projects um, as long as there's interest. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely with Billy, I, I'd love to catch you guys. Um, that band live. So if, you, if you're in Austria or somewhere, I'll, I'll definitely try to, uh, to see you and... Uh, Say hi to Mark also. I, I, I did a record with Mark way back in 2006 and played with him, but then I really need to say hi to him again and reconnect with him somehow. So. Well, he's certainly one of my great teachers as well. Oh. I've, been lucky to, I've been lucky to play with the best, really. I've been very lucky to play with the very best. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's beautiful, you know. That's why it sounds so good also, like you said. <laughs> Come on. No, it helps. It helps if you're playing with the best. If you're trying to make good records, that does help for sure. No, but yeah, like you said, you found your voice. And I think that's like when I listen to this record, you know, I recognize Jack's symbols immediately, of course, and Larry's bass. And then immediately when you play this, you know, the second tune, I was like, man, that's that's you. It's it's totally you, you know, like your touch and like, well, that's a good sign, you know. So yeah, right, right. So, yeah. It's hard in a way uh, on all the instruments. It's hard to get your own sound. Yeah. But on piano, it may be especially hard because everybody plays the same instrument. Yeah. So I, I, I can't put myself in the Thelonious Monk category or the Keith Jarrett category. But I'm working on it. But I, I'm aware that uh, when you hear a record, you know it's me. Yeah, yeah. So that's I think that's that's already such a big step what you did so and what you do. So uh, yeah, cool, Ethan. Well, thanks so much for the interest, man. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks so much for taking the time and you know keep it keep it up like you do. It's beautiful oh, what you great. do. So. Cool, man. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you.